Natalie Lira is an interdisciplinary scholar and assistant professor in the Department of Latina Latino Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her research interests include the politics of reproduction, histories of medicine, and the ways that struggles for racial and reproductive justice intersect. She is an expert on eugenic sterilization, member of the Sterilization and Social Justice Lab, and author of the book, Laboratory of Deficiency, Sterilization and Confinement in California, 1900 to 1950s. In her presentation, Who is Unfit? Centering Race and Disability in Histories of Eugenics, Professor Lira outlines how in California's Pacific Colony, ideologies of racism and ableism converged in the label of the unfit. Her discussion will outline the history of the Pacific Colony, dynamics of resistance and consent, and how racism and ableism play into the decision to institutionalize and into the decision to sterilize. Thank you for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I want to start by thanking those of you that are joining us virtually and express my appreciation to the organizers of the symposium. Uh, what I want to do today is really bring our attention to race and disability as essential lenses of analysis for understanding histories of eugenics, specifically for understanding um, how eugenic notions of who was considered unfit for reproduction, unfit for the rights and privileges of citizenship, and unfit for freedom um, were really shaped by already existing racist and ableist ideologies. And the way that I'm going to do that today is by focusing on one case study. So pictured on the right uh, side of the slide is a black and white image of a landscape view of mountains and several buildings that made up the California State Institution at the center of this presentation, which is called Pacific Colony. Uh, established in 1927 near present day Pomona, Pacific Colony was described by its supporters as a quote, great humanitarian project, end quote. And really this institution represented what many considered to be the most scientific um, and advanced thinking on how to deal with issues of poverty, dependency, um, delinquency, and immorality in the state. And um, Pacific Colony was really supported by eugenic research on feeble-mindedness and um, quote unquote mental defect. Uh, the institution was one of two that was constructed in California to warehouse people that were labeled feeble-minded and one of thousands of similar state institutions constructed throughout the country during the late 19th and early 20th century by examining Pacific Colony, particularly how this disability label of people-mindedness was constructed um, and how it worked to categorize people as eugenically unfit. And by also kind of looking at how this uh, label was implemented and theories of people-mindedness were implemented um, and how they worked to justify some of uh, what are considered the most violent eugenic practices. So, uh, sterilization and institutional confinement. By looking at this history, we really get a sense of how notions of race and disability converge. So I want to start with a quick overview of, um, you know, what I'll do is start with the quick overview of disability. Um, as a lens of analysis and how I apply this lens to understand eugenic notions of fitness and who was unfit. And then I'll go into the case study of Pacific Colony, um, looking at three aspects of the history of feeble-mindedness. So we'll look at knowledge production around this disability label, its gendered application, and then its implementation. I'll also talk a bit about how disability um, and this disability lens can help us reframe our analysis of resistance and defiance in relation to 
particularly eugenic institutionalization and sterilization. And then what I'll do is I'll end with um, some thoughts on eugenic legacies. So most people understand that race is a social construction, right? But many might not be as familiar with the notion of disability as a social construct. And so in lieu of doing a deep dive into uh, the literature of disability studies, I just wanna highlight a couple of things that are really um, essential and, and really shape my analysis in this presentation. So my research is grounded in critical disability studies, and it applies the assertion that disability is a socially and historically informed construct. Of course, this is not to say that physical, um, biological, and neurological differences um, do not exist. Of course, they exist among humans. Um, but the assertion made by disability scholars is that those differences are, and, and their meanings and consequences, right, that they are informed by social and historical context, and that they change over time. So given this point, critical disability scholars, uh, studies scholars assert that we need to study disability not as this kind of fixed biological reality, but more so as a concept that works to signify and shape relationships of power. And um, this assertion also urges us to recognize um, and study the ways that disability labels like feeble-mindedness in this presentation have historically been used to justify inequality and discrimination, both for people that have disabilities, people with disabilities, but also for other marginalized people um, and that works by attributing disabilities to them, right? So some historical examples of this include um, antebellum era pro-slavery arguments, right? That asserted that enslaved black people were mentally unfit for freedom um, and then argued that slavery needed to continue, right? So that's one example. Another example would be, um, arguments against extending suffrage and the right to vote to women that were based on arguments that women were a mentally and biologically inferior gender. So those are some of um, the examples um, that we can see historically how disability gets attributed to other marginalized groups in arguments about um, inequality and, and um, barring freedom and participation in civic life. The other important point uh, that I wanna highlight is that in line with what um, intersectional feminism has taught us is that disability functions alongside other subjectivities. So in her work, a disability theorist, Nirmala Arvelez points out that disability has historically functioned as a quote, ideological linchpin in the constitution and reconstitution of social differences, quote, along the axes of race, gender, and sexuality. And so uh, this image, I think, is really um, illustrative of this point. And um, what we have in this image is a table that lists eugenic criteria for sterilization by state. Um, so we have a list of states and then, you know, the criteria that is pulled from this eugenic uh, sterilization state laws. Um, and so we see from this list um, the legal and medical criteria for uh, mandated sterilization and how it really revolves around um, these disability labels, right? So we see feeble-mindedness very frequently across the states. We also see um, insanity, epilepsy, idiocy. And so you'll notice that none of these state laws explicitly said that um, people uh, 
that we will target for sterilization are going to be poor people or racialized folks or immigrants or promiscuous women. Those are not the, that's not the language that's used in the laws. The language that's used in the laws are these um, disability la labels. And so, you know, um, uh, we see kind of how uh, the labels work to mobilize and legitimize and even um, in a lot of cases naturalize already existing racial class and gender prejudice. And we see how that plays out in looking at the demographics of who was targeted for uh, eugenic sterilization. Um, I'll make a last point here that this is an important departure from some histories of eugenics that situate feeble-mindedness as, you know, um, ignorance, as bad science, and as um, merely a misunderstandings about um, intellectual disabilities. So, you know, these histories kind of situate this um, disability label as kind of a mistake that lives in the past. Um, but really what critical disability studies um, urges us to do is to recognize disability labels like feeble-mindedness as part of a broader set of social categories that um, work together uh, and, and worked within a larger system of power that you know, were, was used to naturalize social hierarchies um, and justify not only inequality, but also these very violent um, medical and state interventions. So Pacific Colony is a useful case study here because it illustrates how eugenic theories of feeble-mindedness were both developed and implemented. So much of my research on Pacific Colony comes from um, these scientific research studies that were conducted in support of the institution. So before the institution was built, um, a group of uh, progressives, um, eugenic researchers in various fields, including psychology, education, juvenile, um, legal um, studies, uh, produced a body of research um, on the need to institutionalize folks labeled feeble-minded and why the state needed to fund um, the construction of Pacific Colony. So a bulk of my research uh, revolves around this body of literature that precedes um, and supports Pacific Colony. And then later on, once the institution opens, it becomes a, a site of continued research, right? Where graduate students um, and advanced researchers come and continue their um, work on, on this disability label. Um, so it becomes a, a site where this theories of feeble-mindedness are developed, also where they're implemented, right? This is where people labeled feeble-minded are confined, where they um, receive different types of treatment um, and where they are sterilized. Um, but it's also an important case study because it gives us a sense of the ways that disability and race uh, whoops, came together. Um, through the targeted uh, institutionalization and sterilization of Mexican origin youth. So I'll share some um, descriptive data here. Uh, several thousand um, people were confined to Pacific Colony over the years. Um, so my research really focuses on um, when Pacific Colony opened in 1927 and um, you know, the arc of its history into the 1950s. In the 1950s, it's, it changes its name. There are some, you know, important changes that happened then, but th that is kind of like the chunk of time that I, I look at. Um, and so several institutional records show that Mexican origin youth, um, both men and women, who were largely in their teens and early 20s were committed to the institution at rates that exceeded their population in the state at the time, um, which was between 6.5% and 8%. 8%. Uh, so for example, a California Bureau of Juvenile Research study estimated that the Mexican population in the institution was 15.3%. In 1935, um, 
so that's the population in 1935. In 1947, the institution's psychology department reports that Mexicans made up 21.2% of the institution's population. And my analysis of admission ledgers um, collected between 1927 and 1947 shows that 21% of the over 4,000 people admitted during this period were labeled with an M, which signified Mexican. Uh, sterilization patterns mirrored uh, admission patterns, and my analysis of over 2,000 sterilization requests processed by Pacific Colony between 1928 and 1951 shows that Mexican origin youth made up almost a quarter of all sterilization requests, and in 1943, they made up 37.5% um, of all sterilization requests. So how did this convergence of race and disability come to be? And how did this disability label of feeble-mindedness work to really funnel Mexican origin youth into the state institution where they could be sterilized? So one of the principal supporters of Pacific Colony was famed American psychologist, uh, Louis M. Terman. And, uh, pictured here, we have um, an image of Terman and an image of um, his widely read book, The Measurement of Intelligence. And so Terman is largely known for his translation and revision of the Benet Simone intelligence tests. Um, he also participated and led um, army intelligence testing during World War I and later on um, gained some fame um, around a longitudinal study um, that he was doing on people that he labeled geniuses. And so, um, you know, Terman was very invested uh, throughout his career in measuring intelligence and he viewed intelligence as a scientific and logical approach to determining social rank and social value. And so he developed um, what became really widely used methods for determining, determining an individual's intelligence level, which he and other eugenicists believed were inherent, right? That a person's intelligence level was inherent that they, you know, were born with this intelligence level, that intelligence was largely immutable, um, and that intelligence was hereditary. Um, and the, some of the methods that they used were, um, you know, intelligence testing and gathering and estimating IQ scores, um, gathering social data to kind of inform IQ scores, and also gathering family histories. Um, and, and they, you know, term in and folks, um, who worked on measuring intelligence and, and labeling people according to their intelligence really um, use these methods to rank people um, along kind of a continuum, a rank system of intelligence that really ranged from genius, right, at the very top, uh, normal, average and kind of feeble-minded and low intelligence at the bottom. And eventually this rank system becomes more nuanced um, and people of low intelligence in particular are kind of further um, ranked and given um, diagnoses that we now see as derogatory terms, but that were at that time kind of these official diagnoses, including idiot, imbecile, and moron. Um, so Terman asserted that, you know, this, um, that intelligence was, was socially important, right? That it was um, an important scientific approach to social organization. And um, he advocated for the use of intelligence uh, testing in schools, right? So it could be used to determine who um, could benefit from education and who should be segregated um, into um, different classrooms, that it was useful in labor and in industry to determine who would make a good manager, a good boss, a good supervisor, a good capitalist, and 
alternately, you know, who should be relegated to kind of low wage menial labor, that it was important in civic life to determine who deserved the right to vote. Um, and of course, that it was important in reproduction, right? Um, because intelligence was seen as hereditary, you know, a cert, uh, figuring out someone's intelligence level was important to determining whether uh, they should be allowed to reproduce or not. Um, Terman and other eugenicists asserted that intelligence, particularly low intelligence, was, um, you know, had broad and severe social implications, that many large social problems, including poverty, crime, and immorality, were caused by feeble-minded people whose low intellectual capacity caused um, what they referred to as, quote, economic incompetence and um, what they also described as kind of socially deviant behavior. So within this broader theory of intelligence, feeble-mindedness came to represent really an individualizing of um, and, and biologizing of large social issues. And to address this problem, Terman and other eugenicists advocated for institutionalization, finding out who, was, who these feeble-minded people were and were warehousing them in state institutions and sterilization, right? Um, you know, uh, ending the uh, reproduction of feeble-mindedness by preventing the feeble-minded from reproducing. And so, Terman used his research and the research of his colleagues to really push for the construction of Pacific Colony. Um, and so a lot of his research also kind of, um, his particular, his particularly his studies on um, IQ scores um, asserted that racialized folks, particularly racialized folks in um, California were more likely to have low intelligence, right? And so he starts kind of um, making connections between low intelligence and race. And his research is proliferated by his students and other researchers in the state. So here I have some quotes um, from, the first is from a 1915 legislative support that was actually um, a research report that was in support of Pacific Colony by J. Harold Williams, who was a student of Terman's, um, and he asserts that, you know, a third to a half of delinquency in California can be prevented by segregation in their early years of feeble-minded children, right? So using the science to support the, the to make the case that the, the state needed to construct Pacific Colony. Um, the second is also from uh, Williams, who conducted a study in California, um, tested um, youth that were confined to uh, juvenile delinquent, uh, uh, juvenile reform schools. And he asserts that with the IQ scores that he collected, um, that black and Mexican youth showed a greater tendency to delinquency because of their low intelligence. And this um, assertion is echoed by the third quote, um, Mary B's Henry, who was an educator and who also kind of does a study in, in, uh, among students in, under her, um, uh, in her school system. Um, and the conclusion of that study that she that she kind of highlights here is that intellectually the Mexican children are consistently inferior to American children, and that this is not due to a language factor, um, but that this appears to be real native inferiority. And so, you know, we see kind of the um, creation of a uh, a theory that not only posits that racialized people are, and particularly Black and Mexican youth in California are um, inherently of low intelligence, but that that low intelligence causes um, deviant behavior, right? That they're more prone to um, engage in, in uh, you know, socially deviant behaviors. And this symptomology is very gendered. And so for young men, you know, young men who get caught up in the juvenile court system, um, 
you know, criminality becomes a, a really big factor. And so we see this, for example, in this sterilization request for a 16 year old Mexican origin boy whose family history is described of being quote, low Mexican type and his clinical history really highlights this history of thefts and malicious, malicious mischief, right? And so engaging in petty crimes, even status crimes like truancy, school truancy, become symptoms of feeble-mindedness um, that then get um, turned into rationales for institutionalization and sterilization. For young women, uh, deviant sexuality is a predominant theme. And so we see this here with this um, young woman who is, um, let's see, uh, 16 years old. And um, what it says is that she um, has been committed to Pacific Colony to keep her from contacting men, um, that she's also suffering from a chronic um, issue in her left leg, and that, you know, um, it's important for her to be, you know, confined um, in order to keep her from contacting men. So the implementation of this convergence of disability, race, and gender was severe in the lives of Mexican origin youth. You know, I went over some of the um, disparities in a previous slide. Um, and so, you know, one of the consequences of being labeled um, people-minded is that you could be institutionalized. And early on in the, you know, um, late 19th century institutionalization was proposed as a reproductive control measure. Um, and so here I'm, you know, citing Nicole Rafter, who, who talks about um, these institutions as, you know, prophylactic institutions. Um, but even with sterilization, um, given that residents lived in sex segregated quarters um, and were constantly supervised, we see that, um, you know, being confined was one way that um, uh, these folks are uh, reproduction is managed, right? Um, under California law, anyone committed to state a state institution could be sterilized at the discretion of the superintendent or the clinician, um, and it was. Um, also used as a precondition for release. So once committed to a state institution, you become a ward of the state and um, decisions around release and treatment are really left up to institutional authorities. And for many um, people that were institutionalized um, and whose parents or family mem members wanted to have them released, um, sterilization becomes a prerequisite for release. Uh, the last way that this theory um, was kind of implemented at Pacific Colony was through an effort at making the feeble-minded productive. Um, and so despite assertions about their incompetence, um, residents were largely, um, they, they sustained the institution through their labor. So they did most of the cooking, they did most of the cleaning, and they even cared for um, the other residents. And so on the right um, of the slide, well, on the left of the slide, you see one of the um, buildings that uh, where folks were um, confined. On the right of the slide is a black and white picture of several cribs in a Pacific Colony nursery. And we see there's an attendant um, towards the front of the photo, but in the back, uh, you can't see it very clearly, but towards the back of this image, you see a plain clothed person who is likely a resident of Pacific Colony. And so one of the cruelest ways that, and one of the most contradictory ways that notions of disability and labor intersected here in Pacific Colony is that at the same time that institutionalized people were seen as unfit to reproduce, unfit to have children of their own. They were charged with caring for young and even infant residents of the institution. Um, many of these um, infants and young people had specialized needs. And so there's this very clear contradiction, you know, um, 
that arises in the institution um, and, and around this question of labor and whether people can be productive or not. Um, Pacific Colony also developed a practice of industrial parole is what it was called, where institutionalized people who were deemed, um, you know, uh, fit enough to potentially be released and who were sterilized were placed in labor or, or work placements outside of the institution on parole. Um, and so they were often leased out as domestics. The young women were leased out as domestics to um, largely middle-class um, and upper-class households in the area. Young men were often leased out to ranch hands. Others went to work in different san sanitariums. Um, and so, you know, this really highlights the way that um, the institution worked to kind of make people um, productive, um, but not reproductive, right? And kind of creates a pipeline for people with disability labels into low wage and so-called low skilled work. So in addition to kind of thinking about race and disability and its function within the institution, I've also, you know, um, thought about the ways that disability can inform our analyses of um, uh, resistance and agency in this context. And so, you know, some of the ways that people defied um, uh, sterilization and institutionalization was by simply, you know, refusing to comply with orders. Another way um, included refusing to consent um, so individuals themselves were not asked to consent for sterilization, but family members were. And so family members often refused to sign consent forms. Of course, this wasn't um, a very effective because under the law, consent was not a requirement. Um, and so oftentimes, even if a family member refused to sign a consent form or expressed um, a desire not to have someone uh, sterilized, sterilization would continue, would proceed. And the last thing um, is escapes. So um, escapes were prevalent. Uh, young people would literally um, either on their own or in collaboration with um, other, other um, institutionalized people um, devise ways um, uh, and, and devise plans for escape. And so what we're looking at here is kind of some reports of escapes from um, in, institution for the feeble-minded. And these often happened when um, uh, residents were working, right? So in the first example, we see John Martinez who was working on a game detail in the vegetable garden um, on the institution grounds said he was gonna go get a drink and didn't return, right? Um, another uh, young man was working um, also in the vegetable garden and left with John, right? So these two likely escaped together. And then uh, the third person, a young woman, Rosario, who was working in the yard and um, she escaped through by cutting a hole through the window, right? And so, you know, these behaviors, this defiance, this disobedience, escapes were all talked about in very pathologizing terms by institutional authorities, right? These were often used as further evidence for why these young people needed to be confined and why they needed to be sterilized. Um, but really thinking about, you know, how these were some of the only ways that um, young people could express discontent and could um, really challenge this um, practice um, kind of helps us um, switch our, um, our lens of analysis here, right? And so thinking about reading against the grain of these kind of pathologizing assertions around these behaviors and, and really thinking through, you know, a lens of disability and, and racial justice here. Um, so I wanna, you know, conclude by 
thinking a bit about eugenic legacies and highlighting just three recent examples. So the first um, revelations that in the 2000s, hundreds of women were sterilized in California women's prisons under the rationale um, given by the doctor that performed these sterilized that they were unfit to reproduce because of their criminal behavior, which is why they were imprisoned. And because any children that they would have would likely become a burden to the state, right? That there were concerns around dependency and that sterilization was more, more economical um, than allowing these women to have more children. The second example, a recent example, um, include comments by um, Kenosha, Wisconsin sheriff made in 2018. Um, and he was talking about um, a recent um, uptick in burglaries. And this sheriff asserted that men that were accused of shoplifting should be quote, warehoused for life um, to stop them, at least some of these males um, from going out and getting um, 10 other women pregnant. And so this, you know, is kind of a, a sort of repetition of this idea of delinquency or this tying together of delinquency, criminal behavior and reproduction, right? And this, um, I think, quote highlights the ways that um, confinement continues to be used kind of or thought of and seen as a way to manage the reproduction of certain people who are seen as unfit. And then the last example that I'll share is very recent um, revelations um, by um, an organization in Georgia in September of 2020 that um, uh, really uh, revealed uh, different types of human rights abuses occurring in um, an immigrant detention center um, that included unwanted hysterectomies. And so again, thinking about how, you know, reproductive and human rights um, continue to uh, occur in settings of confinement like Pacific Colony. And so, you know, what I want to suggest here is that, you know, if we, analyze the history of eugenic sterilization and some of these legacies through the lenses of race and, and disability, we're kind of, you know, it, we're urged to not only trace the, com the consistencies, right, um, but also kind of understand the ways that reproductive injustices are replicated over time, um, particularly through what seems to be very enduring <laughs> logics um, sustained by shifting and overlapping ideologies of race, disability, and gender that affect the reproductive lives of people who continue to be deemed unfit, um, you know, over time and trying to figure out, you know, what those enduring um, ideologies are and how we might start to um, deconstruct them, um, why they continue to be held by, you know, certain physicians who work um, with um, prison populations and other confined populations. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you once again. Um, and I look forward to our discussion.